morning, guys. Today we're going to continue our discussion on uh, two variable quantitative data uh, where we're, we're looking at the SEC football teams and how many points they scored per game um, and using that as a predictor for how many games that they should win. Now, last lecture we talked about how to uh, organize that graphically with a scatter plot and how to look for patterns in that scatter plot. Today we're going to take it a step further and we're actually going to try to build a prediction line. So we're not just looking at what we've observed, but let's say we can predict it for uh, other teams in the league or other teams uh, wherever they may be, maybe in the future, uh, things like that. So when we talk about this prediction line, what we're actually working with is this idea that you've worked before called a regression line. So a regression line is nothing more than a line, an equation that is meant to help us predict what's going to go on uh, in the relationship between two variables. You guys in the past have probably called it a line of best fit. Line of best fit. Now, in the first part of this lecture, we're going to discuss what the components of this line are. Uh, so we're going to kind of jump to the calculator here in a second and actually calculate the, um, the equation of the line. And then in the second part of this lecture, we'll actually talk about how to come up with each of those individual components. But I want to talk about what they mean first. So calculating it is actually the same way we calculated that correlation coefficient that we worked with before. So if I'm going to calculate this regression line, I'm going to go back in the calculator just like I did for correlation coefficient. Uh, X variable in L1, Y variables in L2, and then I'm going to go and hit stat, calc, and just like we did for the regression or for the correlation coefficient, we're going to do option eight, which is linear, linear, linear regression, A plus B X. So uh, real quick, let's jump into the calculator and I'll kind of walk through those steps again for you. So again, going through these calculator steps, we're going to start with stat edit. Uh, in stat edit, we're going to put our L1, our explanatory, our points per game in. In L2, we're going to put our response variable, our number of wins. Then we'll jump into stat, calc, and grab option 8. With our X list in L1 and our Y list is L2. So in the calculator, we should still have the data set saved from the last lecture, so stat edit, L1 are all those points per game, L2 were the number of wins, making sure to match them up as ordered pairs. Then we go stat calc, um, and we're going to grab option 8, X's are L1, Y's are L2, and then we're going to calculate that's what uh, down here calculate. And just like before, we see there's the R that we looked at the other day, uh, 0 0.94. Uh, there's R squared, we're going to talk about them later. And then you see the A and the B. So Y equals A plus BX. So A is negative 3.75 and B is 0 0.44 roughly. So we can see that we get the equation y equals negative 3.75 plus 0.44x. So let's go talk about what each of these numbers means in this equation. We get this equation from the calculator, y equals negative 3.75 uh, plus 0.44x. Now graphically what that's doing is, that's just taking that line, if we were to put the slope, put the y-intercept and slope, uh, you'd get a line that looks something like that, maybe a little bit straighter. But it's the line that runs right through our data set, most closely models. Now, as we can see, it doesn't hit every single point on the data. This is just an approximation line. So if we make a prediction using this line, that means that we're going to be close. We should be close to what um, was actually observed as to happening. And again, in the second part of this lecture, we'll talk about how the equation for this line is calculated from the calculator. So once I get this line, we want, I want to understand the components of the line. So we've got different pieces going on. First off, this line, these y's and x's, they don't mean anything to me. I need some context for those. So when we write an equation for a line, we don't write it as y equals. We write it in context. So the line should be y with this little guy over top of them equals a plus bx. Well, this little hat, or partial triangle over top, the name of this whole thing is called y hat. y hat. 
So it's like we have a Y with a hat on top of it. Now, what does that Y hat mean? Y hat means the predicted response value. So if I said Y equals, remember that our explanatory variable was the points per game, and then our response variable was the number of wins. So my Y value is my win. So what I'm saying is if I say Y equals, I'm saying this is the number of wins for specific points per game. But we don't know it. We know that doesn't match up exactly as we saw in the graph. So we, what we need to do is some way to denote that it's an approximation or it's a prediction. This is what should happen for a certain points per game. You should, should win this many uh, games. But we know it's not going to be exactly the same. So that's why we have to take our Y value, which is our number of wins, and turn it into predicted or expected number of wins. So now that we've kind of identified what this y hat is, the predicted response variable, the predicted number of wins, we can start giving some context to what we see in this problem. So that's how we want to define these, in context. So I don't write y, I write what y represents. So y represents the number of wins. So when I put a hat over it, it's predicted number of wins. Now we are going to see what this equation actually means. So don't just write the equation with y to the next, let's give it that context. So y equals negative 3.75 plus um, 0 0.44 times x. Now my x variable is going to be what? We already said that x was the explanatory. That was what we were predicting by. That's the points per game. So points per game. So this is how I want you guys to write the equation, your, regr your regression equation. I want you to actually write it in context. Don't, not y's and x's, but writing what y and x represent. Now if you want to write it y hat equals negative 3.75 plus point zero, or 0 0.44x, and then say y hat equals this, x equals this. If you want to define it, you can, but I think it's just easier to write it all at one time. All right, so we've identified what we mean by this y hat. Let's talk about what these two numbers, this a and this b, represent. So a is going to represent the y-intercept, because all this is is just a straight line, right? We understand our linear equation, this is like, if I'm going to write the equation of this line, my y equals negative 3.75 plus 0.44x, there are two components to that, right? My constant, which is my y-intercept, and my slope, um, my coefficient of x, which is going to be my slope in this case, which we can see right down here. So, the y-intercept. Graphically, the y-intercept is where you cross the x-axis, right? So we would cross the x-axis at negative 3.75. Cross the x-axis at negative 3.75. So if I was going to kind of interpret what this means, well, if it's where I cross the x-axis as an ordered pair, that's where my x value is zero. So in the context, that's where my um, explanatory variable is zero. So what we're talking about conceptually with intercept, y-intercept, is it's the predicted value of the response, right? Everything's about a prediction in this equation. Predicted value of the response when the explanatory variable is zero. All right, so let's interpret what that means, this specific problem. Now, anytime I'm doing an interpret because these are predictions, I want to lead with the statement, we expect or predict whatever is going to happen after that. We're not saying this is what is going to happen because we know there's variability in the data set. This is what we would expect to happen. Okay. So we're going to write this one out. Um, so what's going on with the explanatory is zero. What's going on with the response is the y-intercept. So in this problem, we expect the response variable, number of wins, to be negative 3.75, okay? When the explanatory variable, 
the points per game is zero. Straightforward. This is what the y value should do when the x value is zero. So we would expect that a team that scores, that averages zero points per game, to win negative 3.75 games. Right? It makes perfect sense. Now, we have to always talk in statistics. Does it make sense in the context of this problem? Algebraically, graphically, that makes sense. But in the context of this problem. So the big thing with y-intercept is once we've interpreted what it means, we always want to consider... Is this statistically meaningful? Does it mean something in the context of the problem? So if I'm looking at this problem right here, um, is it possible to win negative 3.75 games? No, you can't win a negative number of games. We could lose games, but that's not what this is talking about. This is talking about our graph is built off how many games they won. It's not what's the differential between wins and losses. That could be negative, right? But in this one, it's how many games did they, how many wins did they accumulate? So it's not possible to win a negative number of games. So we would just make a comment on that. So we would say something like, but since it's impossible, to win a negative number of games. Since it's impossible to win a negative number of games, um, the y-intercept is not statistically meaningful. It's not worth us spending time thinking about. It's not a point that we need to consider. Now, so what you can kind of think, it's your starting point, so to speak. So if somebody started at zero points per game, how many wins should they expect? Um, so in this case, it's not a useful number. Now, it's not to say if it's negative, it's never a useful number. Uh, if we were doing something and we were predicting temperatures, we can have negative temperatures. So in some context, maybe a negative temperature is a reasonable thing to, to consider. Uh, sometimes it's not even a negative thing. Sometimes the number's so low in that context, it doesn't really mean anything. If we were talking about heart rate or something, and somebody's and the y-intercept was a heart rate of, I don't know, even if it was like 2.3 beats per minute or whatever, there's something going on if your heart rate is 2.3 beats per minute, um, you know, expected 2.3 beats per minute. So Again, see how that works like that doesn't mean anything to us. So it probably doesn't fit in the context of that problem. So it's not just a positive negative situation. What it is, is it what does it mean in the context of that problem? So we always have to make that consideration. All right, so that's what our y-intercept represents. Next, we have our slope. So slope is something that you're familiar with, right? Slope is something that in the graph, it's, it's kind of how the graph climbs, right? How do I get from one point to the next? What do my stairs look like? So you traditionally, when I ask people, so what do we think of when we think of slope? Well, most people say rise over run. So rise over run. Rise over run. Or rate of change. Or from a more technical math standpoint, we could say delta y over delta x. Those are all different ways to define slope. So it's how much does my y value increase or decrease as my x value increases or decreases by a certain amount, right? So what's my rise, my change vertically, versus my run, my change horizontally? Well, it means the exact same thing when we're talking about linear regression models. Right. Well, it means the exact same thing when we're talking about linear regression models. The predicted change of the response variable right, that's the change in y, for every one unit increase in the explanatory variable. So this is where it's a little different um, just in how we get the number. So typically if my line or, or if my slope was three halves, I would say, okay, I'm going up three and I'm going over two. Well, when we're dealing with it, our numbers aren't nice and clean like three halves or 
even 10 sevenths or anything like that. It's 0 0.44. So first off, I've got to turn this into a fraction, some type of rise over row. The easiest way to make any number in a fraction is to put it over 1. So if I put that over 1, now I can see my change in my y is going to be 0 0.44, and my change in my x is 1. Well, if we always put it over 1, that means my change is, um, horizontal change is always going to be an increase of 1. That allows my y to, to take on the sign of whatever the operation is here. So if it's negative, we can say it's a decrease in the y values for a one unit increase in the x. If it's positive, as it is here, we can say it's an increase in the y values for a one unit increase in the x values. So that's why we put it over one, because it makes it always, what's the y doing as we move along the graph? As the x's increase, are the y's going up or are the y's coming down? So that's why we're always going to put it over one. So the predicted change of the response variable for every one unit increase in the explanatory variable. All right, so if I'm writing this one out, I'm going to start with that we expect. Actually, you know what? I want you guys to pause just for a second. I want to see if you guys can write the interpretation of the slope. So what does this slope of 0 0.44 mean in the context of this problem? I'll wait right here while y'all come up with something. Hopefully you guys came up with something like this. All right, so as we can see, I came up with, we predict that the number of wins will increase by 0 0.44 wins for each additional point scored per game. This is the exact same thing we're here. We predict, all right, the change of the response. All right, so what type of change? It was positive, so that's gonna be an increase because it was positive. How much positive? It was positive 0 0.44. So we predict that the response number of wins will increase because it's positive 0 0.44 wins. That was our slope for each one point increase in the points scored per game. One unit increase in the points scored, uh, scored per game. So sometimes you can just say uh, for every one point increase, or here I put for each additional. It, however you want to word that, that's fine. Those are kind of um, interchangeable. But you have to denote that we're talking about an increase every single time in the explanatory, a one unit increase in the explanatory. Um, so each additional point scored per game. So what does that mean? That uh, if you say average two more points per game, if a team averaged two more points per game, now that team uh, should have on average 0.8 more wins per season. Uh, or in this specific season. So almost one more game. All right, so that's how we want to interpret that. So if a team average, I don't know, five more points per game, then that should that team should have about two more wins on their season, right? Just five times the point four four. Um, so that's the idea that we get to from interpreting the slope and the liner. So we're going to do a lot of this, so we need to make sure we understand how these interpretations work. Now that we've talked about how to make the, or what the uh, equation means, what it's telling us, let's actually use it to make some predictions. So I've got two predictions I want you up here to do. Uh, let's do this one first. Predict wins for 20 points per game. So how do I do a prediction? Well, if I want to predict the number of wins, all I need to do is evaluate my function at a certain points per game. So I'm going to take that equation, right, that predicted wins, And plug in negative 3.75 plus 0 0.44 times the points per game in question. So in this case, 20 points per game. So that's easy to do. Just throw that in the calculator real quick. Negative 3.75 plus 0 0.44. I'll let you guys calculate that real quick. And what you should get is 5.05 wins. So 5.05 wins. Now, when we look at that on the graph, that makes sense, right? So uh, we've got 20 points per game. If I come up to my curve, it looks like it's around five wins, right? So all we're doing is taking what we see graphically from the line and doing it algebraically. All right, so let's try this one right here. I want you guys to predict for me the number of wins for 60 points per game. 
So predict for me the number of wins for a team who scores 60 points per game. Uh, when we throw that into our equation, so 20 points just becomes 60 points per game, uh, you should have got 22.65 wins. And so, again, going over, looking at the graph, a, get a team that scores 60 points, if the line kept going, should be somewhere up here. I'm running off the board, off the graph, but it's still it's going to be up here past 16 wins, 18 wins. So probably up there around 23 wins. Seems perfectly reasonable. Now, for those of you who are familiar with college football and how it works, especially back in 2011, um, there's an issue with this answer right here. Okay? It's not possible to win 22.6 or 23 wins in a season. That's an, un, uh, that's an impossible outcome. And the reason is because back then, there were only 13 games maximum in a season. So what we run into is the fact that we are making an observation, right? We're making an observation that's far outside of what we observe. So we observe what's going on from about 15 points up to about 35, 36 points. So in that window, we know this model is going to hold. But outside that window, anything can happen, right? We could get negative number of wins, which we know is unreasonable. We talked about that with our ownership. I could get 23 wins, which we know is unreasonable because... You don't have 23 games in a college football season. So the issue is, in this case, what we call extrapolation. So extrapolation is just making predictions far outside the observed data. Okay. Far outside the observed data. Extrapolation is bad. Sometimes it's necessary, but there's always a caution with it. Um, extrapolation is something we see a whole lot, especially this time of year with uh, it being hurricane season and stuff. So it's really interesting that you'll see uh, all the way out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, you know, maybe off the coast of Africa, some type of storm stirring up, working this way. <clears throat> and they'll have data for like a week, a week's worth of data on it and 15 models out there and all the models look exactly the same. And then they're trying to predict a day, two, three days out and they're looking very much the same. But then as you get into that fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, those models all start changing because every single time you start getting far away from what you've observed, there are more and more variables that get thrown in, more and more unknowns that are going to be introduced that maybe one model picks up but another model doesn't pick up or maybe we don't recognize that there's a 13 game limit on the season especially back in 2011 um, or negative number of wins contextually uh, contextually doesn't mean anything to us so we always want to use our prediction lines to make predictions that are close to what we've observed now again sometimes it's necessary to predict and project way on out there um, all the models and stuff we ran into with uh, COVID-19 with what we knew back in March and April, they, we had to make projections just to try to get an idea of how to get our hands around all of this stuff. So again, those projections that were way far out about what's going to happen, we can see now that a lot of those models, uh, you know, were all over the place and were not accurate as to what actually occurred. So we, we, they're necessary, but there's always got to be a caveat. So when you're looking at data or when you're looking at models and predictions and people are making predictions about things far outside what they've observed, you need to be a statistically minded reader of that information and understand, okay, there's limitations on that information, on what those predictions mean. They can, give us a, they can identify a trend, but they can't identify everything that's going on. We can't take them as gospel, things like that. So... Same, it doesn't matter what it is, hurricane data, COVID-19 data, football wins and things like that. It's all the same as far as how we can use that prediction, those prediction models. All right. So extrapolation gave us a win that doesn't make sense in the context of this problem. Now, the reason this one was so accurate and was so useful is because it was an example of interpolation. 
And turbulation is just the opposite. <laughs> That's where we're making predictions uh, close to or within the observed end. So interpolation is good, while extrapolation or extrapolation is bad. Often necessary, but bad. There's a caveat with it. All right, so that's how we can uh, use those prediction lines. Now, let's step back over to our prediction line. And let's talk about that five wins per inning. All right, so we had our 20-point season right here. Notice how that team right there, all right, that team was right on the line. The team that scored 20 points had exactly five wins. That one actually worked out very perfectly. So if we look at University of Tennessee right here, they averaged 20.3 points per game. They were right at five. That, that team was right on the, uh, on the mark right there. But notice how not all the teams are. Some of the teams um, actually maybe scored above that regression line or one above the regression line. Some were below that regression line. So now I want to talk about this difference between how a team performed and how that team was expected to perform. All right. So when we talk about that difference between performance and expectation, what we're really getting into is something that we call residual. All right. Now, residual, as we can see from the formula, is y minus y hat. Now, this is actually something that we used, have used before, and it's something that we're going to use uh, all throughout this course. It's just a measure of variability. We've seen something that looks similar to this before uh, when we were doing our z-score work, because we would take the value that we observed minus the mean, the expected value for that group. So that's all we're talking about when we deal with residual. We're just not going to standardize it right now. So residual is just taking your observed value And all you're doing is subtracting your uh, predicted value. Observed value minus your predicted value. So it's want to know how far above or below or how far off from the prediction you were. So let's go through and let's do a few uh, values. So you guys can pull up your data on Alabama. So let's just do a prediction for Alabama. So just like we did before, Alabama's 34.8 points per game, 34.8 points per game for Alabama. If I plug that into my equation, 34.8 points per game, I'll be able to predict how many games they should have won. So if we plug that into the equation, Alabama should have had 11.562 wins. All right, so 34 point, a team that won 34.8 points per game should have won 11.562 games. Well, to get the residual, all I need to do is subtract right here. So they won 12 minus what they were predicted to have won, the 11.562 wins. Because remember, that's all we're doing when we're talking about residual. What we observed, 12 wins, minus what we predicted to have happened, 11.6 wins. So when we do our subtraction on that, we get the residual, which comes out to be 0 0.438. 0 0.438. All right, so let's try another one. All right, so, well, sorry, let's look at it graphically. So Alabama sitting here at 35 points per game, and then at 35 points per game, we can see that they should have been somewhere around 12 wins. Well, they weren't. They were just right there at 12 wins, and our graph was written. In this graph, my sketch, I'm right on it. I'm within half a win, almost less than half a win. <clears throat> All right, let's look at um, Arkansas. Arkansas, 36.8 points per game. So if I take 36.8, plug it in for my x value, my points per game, we're going to get a predicted win total for Arkansas to be 12.442 wins. 12.442 wins. So if I look at Arkansas at their... 37 points per game, they should have won 12 and a half games, but they actually were down here, right? They were actually down here at 11 wins. So they were, in fact, 
below that prediction line. Well, graphically, we can see that when we subtract, you're going to get negative 1.442 winds as of the residual. Negative 1.442 winds. So, what we should start to see is this idea of what is residual telling us. Well, residual is just telling us. <clears throat> um, well, actually, let's pause. Right. I want to go back to the list. I want you guys to calculate each of the residuals for the data set for me. Okay, so go back to our original group, and I want you to calculate the predicted number of wins for each point total, uh, and then subtract that and give me the residual uh, for each of the teams. So how much, uh, how off of the prediction line were they? Okay, so I'm going to pause for a minute, let you guys key that stuff in and um, see what y'all come up with. Now that you've made all of your predictions, subtracted what we observed minus what we predicted, we were able to calculate this list of residuals. Uh, since you've done that all by hand now and you kind of know what that is, um, how we generate those, I'm actually gonna let you jump to the calculator real quick and I'll show you how you can create this list of residuals uh, very quickly without having to key in each, um, each and every problem. So to get this residual list on the calculator, uh, you can see it's a few easy steps right here, but the first thing you need to do is make sure you've already run your um, LINREG, your option 8 LINREG. So when we pull up the calculator, since we've already done stat calc LINREG, we can go right back into stat edit. Stat edit, I'm going to go over to L3, I'm going to go up to the L3 header. So not the first entry in L3, but the header in L3. And at this point, I want to go find my residual list. Well, notice above the stat button how it says list in blue. So if I hit second stat, it's going to put me in the list menu. And if you'll notice, option seven down here is the residuals. This only works if you've already done stat, calc, lin, reg. Then it has the formula kind of saved and it'll calculate your residuals for you. So, I'm hit option seven. so what that's going to do is take the linear regression equation that we came up with for L1 and L2 and it's going to calculate all of the residuals and put them in L3. And we get all of our residuals and if you'll notice this looks very very similar to those values that we just calculated by hand or by plugging the numbers into the formula. Uh, these are probably going to be a little bit off because obviously we rounded when we created the formula, but it will be very, very similar to what we got from uh, the method we just used. So that's how you get the residual list quickly in the calculator. Now that we've got our list of residuals, uh, let's go in and let's do uh, use what we really like to get residuals for. That's something called the residual plot. <clears throat> residual plot is just another graph, another way to kind of assess linearity. So looking for the form in what we have. Uh, this one was very obviously linear but, some, linear, but sometimes we get data sets that aren't as easy to identify as linear, whether maybe a curved relationship or something like that. So a residual plot is another tool that will help us identify what that is. Uh, a residual plot, as you can see, is organized. Here's my explanatory points per game down here. So this is just going to be your explanatory. But instead of mapping it to your response variable, we're actually going to map it to the residual. So it's still measured in number of wins, but what it is is number of wins um, either above or below prediction. Uh, so let's go ahead and we're just going to graph. So we've got Alabama there, which at 30, about 35 points per game had a negative, uh, or sorry, had a positive 0.4 residual. So that's Alabama right there. Then we've got Arkansas, who at 37 points per game had a negative 1.4. So Arkansas is about right there. So this is my residual, and this is like my prediction line. And we're just saying how far above or below each group is. So if we were looking at how it relates to the actual scatter plot, we can see here's Alabama, just a little bit above the line. Here's Arkansas, a good bit below the line. So this is like that zero line on the residual plot. We've just turned it uh, vertically, sorry, sorry, turned it horizontally so we can measure those um, changes.
So if we go through and let's finish out the uh, residual plot here. Uh, so next we have Auburn at point at uh, 26 and point 0.4. All right, so here's the residual plot um, that we've come up with. Now, a couple observations about the residual plot. Um, first off, notice how we have some teams above, some teams below the residual plot. And we're going to kind of talk about this later on. But the, there is actually a balance between how many are above, how many are below, and how far above, how far below. And that's kind of how we build the equation, which we're going to look at in part two of this. Um, but... What do we notice about all these groups that were above? What does it mean to be above the line? So we've got the team over here that was uh, two point, almost two wins above the prediction line. All right, so they had a positive residual right there. So what we start should hopefully see is that if you have a positive residual, what that team did was they overperformed what was supposed to happen. Everybody, if they matched exactly the prediction line, would have been at a residual zero. The difference between what we observed and what we predicted was the exact same. There was no difference. But this team had two more wins observed than what we predicted for. So a positive residual is where someone overperforms. Or some, you could say that we underestimate them. So we underestimated how well they per would perform based on the points they scored per game. So maybe these teams didn't score as many points as a team would have, but maybe they had a really, really good defense. And so there were other variables. They had a lot of seniors, a lot of experienced players. So maybe that's why they scored so many more wins than what they were predicted to have won. Well, it's a contrast that we have teams in the negative, like uh, Vanderbilt University right here, was almost a negative two. So even though Vanderbilt scored 27 points per game, they only won six games. So they had a really, really good offense. They were scoring lots of points, but they should have won considerably more games than what they did. So a team with a negative residual is a team that underperforms. or we overestimated how well they were going to do. All right, so maybe it's a team that had a lot of young players, so even though they were scoring lots of points, they were making mistakes or big mistakes at key points in the game. Or maybe they had a really, really bad defense. They just didn't have as much talent on defense as some of the other teams in the league. So that's how we want to interpret um, a, an individual residual. Now, the value of the residual plot is this last question down here. Um, well, actually, for that, I actually want to show you how we can get this on the calculator. So we're going to jump to the calculator. I'm going to show you a faster way to create that residual list and how to actually build this residual plot. So we've already looked at how to generate the residual list um, using the list menu here. Now we're wanting to make a graph. We remember that our statistics graphs come from the stat plot menu. So we're going to hit second y equals. Second y equals. Second button. Uh, then we need to go to plot one. You can go to any of them. I'm just going to pick plot one. Make sure it's turned on. And we just want to set it up so that it looks like this. So plot one turned on. I'm going to choose my scatter plot option. Uh, so similar to what we did before. Uh, when we're making our scatter plot, but instead of matching it with L1 and L2, we said that we're going to map our explanatory value to our residuals. Our residuals we put in L3. So just hit second, number three, that's your L3. And then this is your out, or this is what your screen should look like. Um, anytime we go from a statistics um, or a plot, a statistics plot, and we want a statistics graph, we then need to follow not with the graph button, but the zoom button. So hit zoom, and down here, option 9 on my calculator, maybe a little different on yours. 
But on my calculator, that's zoom stat. This is going to make our window match up to what our data set has. So zoom 9, and we can see we get the residual plot right there. So we can click, quickly create a residual list using the stat list option set on these equals. And then we can turn that into a residual plot by matching up my explanatories with my residual list in L3. So we can see that residual plot. Now that we can build this same graph, this residual plot using the calculator, it becomes a better tool for us. We're not going to do all those calculations by hand. So um, let's look at what a residual plot is really useful. It's to answer this question right here. Is a linear model appropriate? So I'm looking at the pattern. So first thing, if I see a residual plot pattern, so if there is no residual pattern, then yes, a linear model is appropriate. So if it looks like a shotgun blast, there's once I've sketched it, once I've put it into the residual plot, and I can see how far above or below, how things relate to this regression line. If I see no pattern to it, then it is a residual, then it is linear rather. So it should look like a shotgun blast. Now, if I see a residual pattern, then it's nonlinear. So I could get um, points that maybe they kind of mirrored what we saw here, and then they did this, and we didn't have these low values, and then maybe we had some points come back in here. So maybe a few of these teams had jumped up here, and this team had jumped up here, and we would have got this kind of curve to it. This kind of residual pattern, maybe that's a polynomial function of some sort, maybe a polynomial model would have worked better, or um, a trig model, something like that. So if we had seen this pattern right here, so really if this guy and this guy didn't exist, then yeah, maybe a linear model is not the best fit because we had seen some type of residual pattern there. So if you plot the residuals and you see a residual pattern, then you can say it's nonlinear. Um, but since in ours we didn't see a residual pattern, we had these points just kind of willy-nilly all over the place, that told us that, yes, this is a linear model, which we saw from our graph. Uh, it was very, very linear, and we saw that again. Correlation coefficient that... It told us how strong it was once we saw that it was linear. All right, so that's it for this first part um, of our discussion on least squares regression. Um, so and check out part two where we're going to look at all the components of how this equation comes about, where it comes from, um, what the calculator is doing, and um, another measure of the variability and kind of the usefulness of it with the coefficient of determination. We'll talk about... Um, Calculation for least squares regression line and coefficient of determination in part two. So make sure you check out part two. But I will see you in class tomorrow.